Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer, and today I'm going to be taking a look at the first expansion for Rome Total War 2. Now Rome has had a few DLCs so far, there's the Blood and Gore DLC which allows you to have a more gruesome and perhaps accurate battlefield where you have decapitations. They've also got a few DLCs that add different camp, uh, countries or tribes as playable characters, but this is the first actual uh, expansion that changes kind of the base game. Um, the expansion is called Caesar and Gaul, and it focuses on the Gaelic Wars between the Romans and various Gaelic tribes uh, between the years of 58 and 50 BC. Uh, this was the campaign or the series of campaigns that really made the, um, at the time, proconsular uh, Caesar famous, and it's what allowed him to rise to the rank of um, emperor. So Gaius Julius Caesar was the commander on the Roman side, or the main commander on the Roman side, um, and at the time he was part of the first triumvirate, uh, which was a group of three rulers uh, in Rome, um, three major political rulers between uh, Marcus, Linus, Crassus, Pompey, Pompey and uh, Caesar himself and he was a pro counselor at the time. But as I said, uh, the game takes place between the year 58 BC and 50 BC. There are four playable countries, the Romans, the Avarni, the Subii, and then the final playable country, which is, and the final uh, playable tribe is the Novari. Uh, each one of these were different of principal tribes, if you will, uh, that the Romans fought. Um, the Avarni were kind of the, the last major kingdom to fall and had the most famous ruler, um, which I'll talk about later in this video. The Subii were a German tribe which was migrating into Gaul or present-day France, and uh, the Navari were amongst some of the bravest fighters that Caesar would face, and they, they fought mainly in the, the area of Belgium. Um, so in this video, or in this series of videos, I'm going to be playing as the Romans, and I'm going to try and duplicate Caesar's success. I really haven't played the game a whole lot yet, um, or the expansion. I really haven't played the expansion a whole lot yet. Um, so this is going to be kind of a little bit of a learning experience for me. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, the game does kind of shrink down the time frame. As I said, it only takes place from 58 to 50 BC, so... Uh, one turn no longer is you know several months. I believe each turn is a single month, um, and you know rather than uh, taking place from something like 250 BC all the way up to you know the turn of uh, BC to 80, whatever you're going to call that, uh, the game just takes place over eight years. Uh, those those pivotal years when the Romans took over Gaul, which like I said is mainly modern day France. It does also include Belgium and uh, small slivers of Germany and Switzerland. But at this time, it's actually interesting to me because at the time that the Romans uh, started moving against the Gauls, uh, the, the Gauls were regarded as, as somewhat civilized, or at least respected by the Romans. Um, it kind of seems different than a way, the way they're typically portrayed in books and media that aren't based on historical fact anyway. Um, so in that sense, you know, it's a, and it's it's an interesting difference there to me. The Romans definitely respected the Gauls. It was only 50 years prior that the Gauls had actually uh, seriously threatened mainland Italy, and it was Gaius Marius who was a counselor at the time who had to fight several very deadly and, and battles against the Gauls to barely kind of hold them off. The Romans also had quite a bit of trade with the Gauls at the time. Um, between various merchants, and uh, Gaul was somewhat wealthy. Um, so, you know, a lot of the barbarians the Romans would fight later weren't all that wealthy. You know, the wealth of the empire uh, tended to come from sort of, I don't want to say civilized, but the more built up or kind of classical cultures that the Romans took over. So, you know, the Greek cities and, and whatnot, those were very uh, lucrative prizes. Uh, the Carthaginian Empire's territory was definitely a prize, um, especially sort of the, the basin along the, uh, the Mediterranean coast in North Africa, which was very suitable for farming. 
um, the Syria and sort of the, the cradle of civilization would become a very profitable area for the empire. But France, uh, Gaul, you know, despite this, this impression of these barbarian and warlike people, which is definitely um, encouraged or um, definitely something that is perpetrated by um, most uh, more basic understandings of, of the, the enemies of the Romans, the Celts. Despite uh, many of their warlike traditions, they were, again, the Romans would not call many people civilized other than themselves, but they were a well-developed culture, a well-developed society. They had um, rather large cities, and while they were more mobile than traditional cultures, they did also have quite a bit of wealth, and Gaul would turn into a very important province for Rome as the years would go on. Now this campaign would actually solidify Rome's control over Gaul, or, uh, or France if you will, um, basically from 50 BC all the way through until the late 2nd century under Marcus Aurelius, uh, from really 161 to 180 was really the first time that anyone seriously challenged Roman control over Gaul. So, you know, it's a, it's a pivotal campaign, but it's interesting that you see a lot of the um, things that made the the Romans um, interested in taking over Gaul, or a lot of the triggers for the Roman intervention in Gaul, would repeat themselves uh, some hundred or two hundred years later, uh, when the uh, Germanic tribes would again threaten Gaul uh, when Marcus Aurelius was emperor. Um, kind of, uh, I'm going to summarize this. I'm not an expert in Roman history, but I have done some research for this, so. Um, if you hear anything that you think is wrong, by all means let me know. I have done a little bit of research on this, so I'm very confident in this, but I will not pretend to know everything about um, Roman or uh, Gaelic history. So if you, if you believe I made a mistake, by all means please let me know, because I want to improve these videos. But basically, um, the Subii, which was a German tribe, were migrating into Gaul around this time period and there was a lot of unrest because of this migration. There were these tribes that were being pushed out of Germany by other tribes and the lack of them you know, being able to successfully loot and pillage other territories. So they were moving into Gaul, into perhaps richer territories. And this is almost an exact mirror of what ended up causing the conflict later in Roman history some 200 years later, except that around that time Rome was beginning to weaken and was not able to as successfully resist these Gaelic tribes. Um, it really wasn't, you know, under Aurelius that the Roman Empire began to show its cracks. It was really some time later, maybe 30, 20, 30 years after his death, but that was sort of the, you know, foreshadowing uh, the, the next some 200 years and how things would play out uh, in the Roman Empire and uh, along the Gaelic frontiers. So, without boring you too much here, as you can see, this map, uh, we start with five provinces. We've got four provinces in uh, Italy, or it's called uh, Cisalpine Gaul, basically parts of Gaul that are kind of behind the Alps. And then we've got one territory which borders Spain, which would be kind of in touch with our, our colonies in Spain, which we had taken from the Carthaginians during the Punic Wars some hundred years before. Um, so as far as that's concerned, you know, you definitely see you definitely see that we have some division uh, amongst our, our lands here. We are somewhat split up. We've got our main bulk and our forces on the right, or on the east. We've got a small force on the west. But we do have some friendly territories here in the middle, these kind of green territories that kind of almost split southern Gaul or southern France in two. Um, which I'm going to try and use to my advantage. So my goal is to kind of strengthen my friendship with these tribes in the middle of Gaul um, and then isolate the tribes either east or west so I can kind of destroy them in piecemeal. Uh, right now Gaul is divided, which should be something we can use to our advantage uh, rather significantly. Um, it's something that Caesar used very well and uh, is one of the keys to his success. It's also one of the key reasons that the Romans became involved in Gaul. Um, 
there were several pro-Roman allies who were being threatened by these new expansionist uh, colonies, and the Helvetii was actually the first tribe that Caesar would attack, and that's who I'm going after right now. They only have one province, uh, and they're relatively weak, so I want to kind of try and destroy them first. Now what happened historically was the Helvetii wanted to migrate uh, further west and find a new homeland in Gaul, and uh, the, the Romans were not interested in that. They wanted to keep the Helvetii where they were. They didn't want them moving west. It would have endangered some of the pro-Roman Gaelic tribes and risked perhaps Roman relations with these tribes. Furthermore, the Helvetii where they were located were acting as a nice buffer against the Subii and other German incursions into Gaul. So it was really in the Roman interest to keep the Helvetii in place. The Romans did tell the Helvetii this and basically told them, do not move. The Helvetii did not listen and began to try and migrate. Uh, the first real battle occurred when Caesar ended up fortifying a river crossing in the face of the Helvetii advance and uh, pushed them back and prevented them from being able to um, being able to essentially relocate as they would have liked. And um, that's kind of one of the, the big differences between Rome Total War II and Rome Total War I, is that in Rome Total War I, very ahistorically, the Gauls were just grouped as this one giant culture and one giant empire, and that was really not the case. And I'm really impressed with this campaign in that it does seem to accurately divide the Gauls up into many different tribes uh, that all have very different interests and relations, and at least the initial part of the game here seems to be somewhat realistic in that the Gauls are divided. Some of them are pro-Roman, some of them are pro-Gaelic, some of them are just interested in fighting each other, and uh, I think that's a, it's definitely a, um, an interesting take on it, because the Gaelic Wars were not a single war where Caesar conquered France. It was a group of wars, uh, often, you know, very similar to modern-day conflicts, where Rome was almost acting like the policeman between these various tribes and playing them off each other. Um, it would really for foreshadow the way that Rome would really stay powerful for many years to come. Even as Rome's power was was declining, you can especially see it during the wars against Attila the Hun, where the Romans would ally themselves with certain other powers who they might consider barbarians and use them against you know a common enemy and then turn on them. Or maybe in reverse, really, the Romans fought the Visigoths uh, with the Huns, and then when the Huns were a threat, the Romans used the Visigoths to fight against uh, the, the Huns. And while that eventually did end up causing animosity and, and may have helped even speed Rome's decline at the end, it probably kept it in place longer than it would have been otherwise. Um, and it's another one of those same tactics that the Byzantine Empire, the Eastern Roman Empire, would continue for over a thousand more years, and was a key reason, no doubt, that the Byzantine Empire was able to survive as long as it was. Um, but really, this, this Let's Play, if you will, is kind of turning into a little bit of a history lesson. Um, the Helvetii have got them besieged. They've only got one one capital there. You see the Tulagini. I'm going to butcher all the pronunciations in this series, so I do apologize for that. But they are you know, very friendly, kind of to the north and to the east, with a, a couple of other tribes. As you see here, I've got them besieged. I am losing some men to attrition, which happens when you besiege the city. Basically, when you surround a city and you... You, you lay siege to it. If you don't attack it right away, you will slowly lose men uh, to the natural uh, causes of essentially a siege war. So as you kind of dig trenches to get closer to the walls or parallels, which we could discuss perhaps in a later video, um, you open yourself up to getting hit. And uh, that's what's happening. It's simulated there as I'm losing you know, about 10% of my force per turn. So it's definitely not uh, not a small amount, but I do outnumber them quite substantially. Rather than fight a frontal assault, though, against a city, I'd rather just kind of wait, wait it out, because I, I don't want to take the huge losses that I would take if I assaulted the city. As you see there, lost about another 200 this turn. Um, and as you can see, we've also played several turns already, and it's still 58 PC, so that kind of spells out that, you know, multiple turns per year phase. It's, while eight years sounds small, it's, it's quite of in-depth and lengthy uh, expansion or campaign or however we want to consider this. Um, but I'm really, they've only got enough food to survive a total of three turns. I'm just going to wait them out. They're down to their last turn here of food, and it looks like they're sallying forth since they're more or less starving now, and, uh, 
and you know they're going to try and break the siege by uh, by defeating my army. I'm going to go ahead and fight the battle out. It's the Battle of uh, Octoduron uh, in 58 BC. This is following history pretty well. Um, there were small engagements where I didn't really fight uh, outside of the city. Then we're besieging their main fortress. And uh, in history, the Helvetii were destroyed all in the year of 58 BC. Um, it was actually quite a, a bloody conflict. Um, so hopefully I'm as successful as the Romans were against them. Um, I always find, you know, the Helvetii were supposed to have over a quarter of a million people in their, in their tribe. Um, I'm always curious how accurate those numbers are. Uh, it seems that normally numbers from these these wars are much higher than what they probably really were, and it seems to be the consensus that you know if you read a battle of you know tens of thousands of men, typically it's not the case. It's safe to say the Romans had about uh, Caesar had about four legions in Gaul at the time the war started, so that would have been more or less a maximum of about uh, of about. 40,000 Roman soldiers, because the Romans are pretty good about keeping their own numbers and being pretty accurate. And the legion did amount to about 10,000 men. Now, obviously, the battles in Rome total war are much smaller in scale than that, so I'm setting up my uh, my line here. Uh, I prefer always, more or less, to let the enemy come to me. I'm not big on launching attacks. i much rather set up a defensive position. So I'm going to put these uh, these Celts, these some mercenaries, some just you know my soldiers that aren't Roman up front. I'm gonna get some range troops behind, and then um, I'll put my uh, my Roman soldiers behind that to kind of keep my Roman soldiers safe and healthy. I, I like to use the barbarians almost almost like a shield, and we're gonna refer to anyone in these videos as uh, as a barbarian who's not Roman, even if they're fighting on our side. So. Um, just setting up kind of like a defensive line here, as you see, I'm refusing that flank on that one side, and then I've got mainly up front, I've got the uh, the Celts, um, who hopefully will take the brunt of any any potential enemy attack. Uh, I've got some range troops behind, so they can shower the enemy with missiles while um, while the front line is fighting. I've also got some heavier equipment here, some Ogners and some Ballistas. That'll shoot ranged weapons, um, and then we'll put a reserve legionary unit up front here. I really am impressed by these Ogners and Ballistas. They're very useful in combat, and I really do enjoy using them. So, um, definitely something that I, I honestly never really used a whole lot until this campaign, and now using them in battle, they just seem so much more useful. Um, than really I thought they would be. I thought they'd mainly be useful as kind of a, a siege force, but uh, they're more useful than that, at least in my opinion. So just kind of tweaking my, my setup here. Um, I outnumber the enemy pretty heavily, so I could be somewhat risky or, or reckless with my troops, but some of these Gaelic tribes are absolutely massive, and um, I really don't want to don't want to take any chances. Just want to set up my line as best I can, and I'm not a Rome Total War 2 expert. I play a lot more Scourge of Wars. You've probably seen if you've watched my videos. So, you know, if this looks like something that is just a disaster of a setup, uh, and you have any tips, let me know. I'm also going to be putting together a condensed Let's Play of this uh, campaign. And, uh, editing the video a little bit differently. This is more just a straight playthrough, but uh, I'm gonna kind of condense my uh, my video down and shrink it into a into a let's play, and uh, probably have it posted on wargamer.com as well. So if that's something you're interested in, check that out. One of the things I always enjoyed from Rome Total War One, and it appears they carried it over a little bit here, is kind of the motivational speeches that your your leader would give, um, kind of summarizing different things about the battle, about your foe, and they definitely have it here, so I, I do enjoy that. Just kind of waiting on the enemy. I don't see anyone, so uh, I'm not quite sure where they might be. I don't want to wait too long, though, so I'll probably fast forward here until they get in range. Yeah, I don't, don't see anything. I don't like fast forwarding because it seems like you can get yourself in a lot of trouble 
with the enemy getting behind you. But uh, in this case, it doesn't look like I have a whole lot of a choice. I don't even see where they are, so let's go ahead and speed things up a bit. Still nothing coming up. Still waiting. I could march, but I, I don't even know where to march to. Okay, there we go. Um, the enemy's coming up that hill. I must have been kind of behind the reverse slope there. I love this uh, highlight cam, if you will, where you can kind of zoom in and, and see things as if you're a soldier in one of these units. And with the ranged siege weapons, you can even, um, you know, aim one of the units, uh, one of the units' weapons. In this case, a stone, and uh, aim it and then fire it and kind of watch it go, which I think is really cool, really awesome. Um, I know the Distant Guns series has something like that uh, for the that, that battleship game um, where you kind of see as, as shots are fired, but it's only from a, uh, you know, an, you don't control the turret or where the, the shots are going like you do here. Um, so I'll be honest, I find myself getting caught up in battles by trying to control this. Obviously I'm not the greatest. The computer would probably have more kills than I have so far with this. But uh, I do enjoy doing it. Sometimes it does get me in trouble in battles, however, where I just kind of seem to forget about commanding my troops and just uh, take this type of thing over. Those Ogners and Ballistas, though, as you can see, it's almost like a bowling ball straight into the enemy lines and is, is very effective at uh, destroying the enemy. My uh, Celtic warriors who are out up front, I probably would have been better served charging them into the enemy. They, I, I believe they tend to do much better on a charge. Roman soldiers are very good in defense, but the uh, the Celts are, are much better on the attack. However, um, be it my ranged units behind, or my um, just you know the strength of my line here, the enemy is already wavering. You can see their their standards are turning white, which means they're wavering. They're about to start retreating. They're definitely losing the battle here. You can see more of my terrible marksmanship here as I'm trying to take out some of the enemy ranged units. Just seems like I'm always off. Granted, they're a pretty small target. There's only a few of them here. And the enemy's already retreating, so... Um, there, I got one of them. So I've won the battle here. Now I'm going to continue fighting. I'm going to use my cavalry for what they're really ideal for. Light cavalry, you can use them in a charge, but they get mowed down, especially by Gaelic swordsmen just so easily. That's something if you're playing this game you want to keep in mind. Do not charge your light cav into enemy swordsmen. They will get decimated. Unless you're coming in on the flank or the rear. It's just a bad idea. Um, however, once they're broken and routed, uh, you can destroy entire enemy armies as I'm, uh, as I'm about to do here. Now, um, I don't want to you know, make you watch as I, as I round up every single one of them, so uh, it's safe to say that I, I do destroy their entire army, and uh, not that it really matters, because anytime you have an enemy army, you know, surrounded in a city, if you win the battle, the entire force is either surrendered or killed or destroyed, whether you play it out or not, so this is just kind of for my own fun, just sort of rounding these guys up. I'm going to go ahead and skip to the end of that, though. Alright, so here you see I've uh, won a decisive victory, as I, uh, as you have already you know, known. Just had to fast forward a few minutes there. So I've destroyed the entire enemy army. There's a couple of survivors that look like they made it off the map, but more or less almost the entire thing was destroyed. They only killed 87 of my men, so just an amazing victory, better than a, a 10 to 1 kill ratio. And then there you see my uh, my little avatar there destroying the other guy. All that blood spewing out of him, that's from the, the Blood and Gore DLC. That's not something you would see in the normal stock game. So, uh... A little bit different there. Uh, it's only, what, two ninety nine. I mean, you can say it's a trivial waste of money. Maybe you'd enjoy it, I'm not quite sure, but uh, for what it's worth, that's where that extra animation came in here. Um, just, we're going to fast forward a bit. Looks like the Helvetia, I still have that one army that I kind of drove off. We've taken the province. Um, the I've gotten some kind of Imperium thing here, which gives me, I guess, more control. And I, I've increased my rank as my soldier, so um, we've captured the settlement. Uh, we've raised the settlement, so I decided to basically burn everything down to the ground. The Romans tended to execute or enslave their populations. Actually, in the case of the Helvetii in real life, the Romans actually um, they massacred some who fled and refused to surrender. But other than that, they actually um, 
allowed the remainders to survive. Now, it was a very small percentage of the population. It was something like 10% of the population were survivors. But you have to remember, they didn't want to let the Helvetii move. They wanted to use them as a buffer against the Subii and other German tribes. Um, so the Romans did end up feeding and providing shelter for the surviving Helvetii strictly because they wanted to um, you know, keep them as a viable force to help uh, lessen Rome's difficulty in dealing with German tribes. The Romans were smart in that they would use uh, conquered peoples to help solidify their own gains. So raising the settlement and taking it from Iorn are not quite in, in uh, um, accordance with what the Romans actually did. But anyway, it's a game, so... Um, so I'm just kind of uh, managing the city. I want to kind of... Uh, my goal here in most of my cities is to uh, just build stability. You know, income's important, but in these conquered territories, stability is far more important. So Romanizing the colonies as quick as I can and building uh, buildings that uh, improve the sanitary and uh, public order in the city are going to be my key focus on any conquered territories. I can't issue any edicts yet there, you see, because I don't own the whole province, but as I said, my entire goal of of this campaign is to pacify Gaul, to basically set it up for success as a long-term Roman colony, not a short-term profit center, even though, as I've already said, this campaign really only lasts for uh, eight years. Uh, I'm, I'm playing it as I would think Rome would want to play it, so we have that. I'm going to go ahead and fast forward. You can see here the Aduii are actually proposing a trade agreement with me. There's some of those middle colonies which are somewhat friendly to me. Now, of these middle tribes, there's three or four tribes here in the center of Gaul that I'd like to use to split my enemies in half, and maybe act as a buffer against the western Gaelic tribes while I deal with the eastern tribes. Um, and I'm just going to kind of do whatever they want me to do in those central tribes to keep them happy with me and keep my western conquests safe, especially Hel the Helvetii conquest here, because a lot of these other tribes around the Helvetii are very strong and can be somewhat of a, a risk in my uh, limited experience. I played the campaign two other times, and both times I ended up uh, giving up shortly thereafter as my army under Caesar was wiped out because I tried to play a little bit too aggressively. Uh, granted, it's not like I got really far into it and restarted, probably only about an hour, just kind of testing things out. Um, but there you see I've got the city, the province held, I've got my army here. Uh, it's getting kind of later in the year, and I don't want to be campaigning in the winter, because there are definitely some penalties to that. If you're out in an area where you don't have a road, your men will get hit by attrition, and they'll just lose troops just because of the weather. So I'm going to kind of let Caesar rest here for a bit. I know I've only taken one province, and we don't want to jump out of uh, the year 58 BC with such limited success. But uh, for the meantime, I don't see much much profit in rushing off to fight another enemy, only to have uh, Octoduron, or whatever that city is called, in my rear rise up and revolt. It doesn't do you much good to take a city, only to have to go back in and retake it shortly thereafter. So that's my focus here. Now, this video has been going on about 28 minutes. It's probably a good place to stop for this Let's Play. So I'm going to go ahead and stop it here. Um, I appreciate you know you, you you watching here. I really I hope you enjoy it. If you have any questions or comments on you think I can improve this, let me know. As you can see there, there's the political map of kind of my goals here. I'm not at war with anyone, but I probably will look at taking on the the Tugulii or the the Tulangini, uh, the tribe here to the east who are very close friends with Helvet AI, who I recently destroyed. So that's why they're bright red. The darker red, the less that country likes you. Uh, the brighter green, the more they like you, and if it's kind of in between, there's really no preference. But anyway, um, before we get into more of that, I'm just going to go ahead and cut the video off here. I appreciate you watching. If, um, like I said, comments, questions, leave them in the thread. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer signing out.